Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 326 for Monday, November 15th, 2021. And welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in a very dark studio in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. You're enjoying a really fantastic Indian summer in Napomo, California. It's Paul Kent. <laughs> You're, uh, my issue is not weather created. It is nerd created or lack of nerd created. <laughs> my, uh, <laughs> my, my studio is, is soundproofed and so also light proofed, even though it's, it had, it has windows. Those windows have been kind of sealed over. Uh, I have these lights that I put in the studio. I don't know. I think it was some, sometime during pandemic. I was like, oh, I've always wanted like color changing lights in the studio. So I have them and they're great. Uh, but they're Wi-Fi and, you know, smart bulbs, let's call them. And they, it's awesome to have them in the studio because I can, you know, when we're having rehearsal or whatever, I can like set the tone and the vibe and it's fun and it's great. You know, it's something to do. Today I came in here, I turned on the lights and three of the four bulbs are in factory reset mode, which means that they flash to tell me that they're in factory reset mode. So to record the show, I opted to go in far darker mode than flashing light mode. And I think or I've made a bunch of mushrooms, right? Exactly. I didn't have the mushrooms at, at the ready. So I figured, I figured dark mode was better than flashing light mode. So there mm. you go. Yeah. 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 Our sponsor for this episode is ultimate ears pro. They've got some deals. Like normally they have their gig gab 20 coupon deal, which gets you 20% off, but there's an even better deal that they have, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So I'm excited about that. So, and they, we have our own URL there now, which is fun. So I like that. I know. They've been a great sponsor. They have. Yeah. So we will talk, we will talk about the details of that shortly here. I, um, I didn't have any gigs this weekend. In fact, I am heading into my, what I assume will remain my winter slowdown. I did see a gig this weekend. I went and saw that, um, that rush tribute band Lotus land again, which is good. To see. I hadn't seen them since pre-pandemic. Uh, I think that actually the last time I saw them was the night we all found out that Neil Peart died, which was an, sort of an interesting twist of events to, mm. to be going to see them. Yeah, that was back in January 10th of 2020. And it was the right place for us Rush fans to be. You know, it was a nice sort of way to gather together and celebrate, you know, uh, all the music. But I saw them at this place over in Portland, Maine called Aura, where I've seen a bunch of shows. This is a place that, is built specifically for rock shows. It's a, it's got a huge stage, great sound system, great lights. It's except it's small. It's like, you know, a thousand people, but it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, built as a bi level theater. So there's seats up top. The, the bottom is a multi-tiered thing, uh, that can have seats or, or can just be GA. This, this event was, uh, seated and also fully vaxxed and all of that good stuff, which is great. But um, I had never heard this band sound so good. Like they really, it was, you know, it was the right room for them. Uh, it just sounded fantastic. Uh, awesome. Yeah, it was good. I noticed though, you know, I've always said that playing, and this is not just true of Rush music, like this, this lesson definitely extends beyond, but listening to Rush before I ever started dissecting it to play it in a band, which is very different from just playing along with the recordings right on the, you know, on the record, which I did plenty of as a kid. Uh, but the first time I played a Rush tune in a band was, uh, we played Dreamline in a band I was in in Austin in like 1995 or something. And, and this lesson still comes back anytime I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm exposed to the music either with Rush playing it or another band playing it, or even, you know, the, the few times that I've played Rush tunes and bands is their tempos are much slower than you think they are. Uh, th and that allows them room to play the intricate passages in a way that a, they can play them accurately or can be played accurately uh, and B can be heard accurately. Mm. You know, the, I, and it's, it's always interesting. And I, I noticed the other night, the same kind of thing. 
the the there were a few moments where the the bass player started like rushing the eighth notes in in like a build up passage or something. And I just heard the drummer just like, nope, this is where we will stay right here. You know, like we're going to be here because we've got something complex coming up around the corner and we don't want to be racing into that. We want to have that groove going so that we can play those intricate things and, and have them lock in and all that stuff. And it's just, you know, the importance of tempo and different music has different needs with that. There, there's some music. I mean, go listen to, to, you know, Brown Sugar, right? Like, which I realize is a song that, that has been canceled now. Uh, but, or, or, or Honky Tonk Woman, go listen to the record of that. Like it speeds up throughout the record. Uh, and, and it should, like there, there is an energy that is added, uh, you know, speeding up a song is one way of adding energy to a performance. Obviously it can be overdone. It can be done at the wrong times. It can be. There's a lot of wrong ways to do it and a lot of right ways to do it, but it is not necessarily definitively wrong for the tempo of a song to change and evolve throughout a performance of that song. I agree with that. And one of the most obvious ones for songs that a lot of bands cover is September by Earth, Wind & Fire. Oh, 5 BPM right in the intro, man. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And you know what? I think that's a studio mistake, though. I, I, I don't think that was, I could be wrong. Do you know if that was intentional? I don't know, but I, I will say that, um, you know, Russ is, is my drummer. Russ is a, a pretty good student of, of his parts, song structures, that type of stuff. He, he typically takes the BPM, you know, that of the songs original. And it's funny because there's a lot of times like when I'll count something off. So, I learned pretty early into into the band that I was letting adrenaline get to me and, and I sure. was counting things off faster and faster and faster. And I learned to really take a breath, you know, kind of like get the signature lick in my head and, and start feeling to that and counting to that. Um, and then sometimes you'll learn that live or in, in the moment live, like deep into the second set or third set or fourth set, you want to push things a little bit, right? And, yep. and Rush will be like, you know, that, that's a little fast. And, you know, not, you know, just letting me know, not, not like telling me it's wrong, but just like, sure, you know, FYI. Think, yep. think about what you're about to do. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. Make this decision with your eyes open, not closed. That's right. Yeah. 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 But, uh, you know, that whole thing about tempos being fluid as a big, I, mean, I haven't mentioned in many, many, many months that I'm a very big Springsteen fan. I, I, you knew that, right? You know, it was funny. I, I had a, 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 a jam with, with some of the Fling guys this weekend and, and Springsteen came up and one of them told me that, they, you know, they, they, those guys listened to the show and they told me they thought that you were a Springsteen fan. And I yeah, said, yeah, yeah. I had no idea, no very idea, yeah, yeah. no idea. No, no, they're clearly paying attention and I appreciate it. More than that. me. Yeah. 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 But there are, there are, uh, you know, several examples where, you know, that show is a testosterone filled live, Yes, you know, and, uh, it's interesting to me. Some of the songs, they very, they feel slow to me with a lot of air in the groove for mm -hmm. some of the things like, um, Atlantic city. Can you picture what the, what the tempo is for that? I don't right? think I know that song. So it's All right. a no, anyway, but it, it's, it's a, it's a slower than mid tempo, yep. you know, song. Right. And, yep. um, and they hold it back and it's really interesting to hear the air in the space when they hold it back live and let it go. But then, you know, like one that I always really liked is, uh, the Detroit medley, which is, you know, pedal to the metal. Right. Yeah. 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 That one's cooking. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and it cooking, it's cooking even more by the end. Right. Right. And, um, I think that's, I think that's part of performance. I think, you know, totally. that, that is, like you said, it's a way to build, it's a way to build the energy and it, like you do it right and you do it wrong. And if you're doing it sloppily because you can't hold it back, that's, that's not right. Right. But as a, as a tactic to kind of feel that the song is taking you to a slightly faster place as, as the, as the vibe of it builds throughout the, the, the performance of it. I think, I think that's awesome. Oh yeah. No, you know? it's like Springsteen and the Stones, to me, and they're not obviously the same, but they're very similar. They employ similar tactics at times in in their live shows where, the you know, if you're going to stretch out the ending of a tune and it's really just the same progression over and over again, there's nothing different happening. You're, like there's not even a solo happening. It's just 
you know, party vibe, right? Which is, which is a thing that certainly the Stones do and Springsteen, I, at least from what I've experienced, it does at times too. Like the whole way of making that work is adding a little bit Push. to the tempo yeah. at, on each turnaround. We, we did um, in a, uh, I think it was, it wasn't October's, maybe September's Madhouse, which again, I'm really uh, like, <laughs> it, I say it and I'm happy Madhouse is over. Uh, we, we had fun doing it, but it, it, you know, all good things must come to an end. Uh, we played, uh, can't always get what you want. And if ever there was a song that was built to have an, a cello rondo throughout, that's it. And we, you know, we finished the tune and it, it, it was great. It was super energetic and, you know, everything in our, our sound engineer, as we were packing up, Andrew turned to me and said, he's like, I don't know that I've ever heard uh, you know, that tune that fast. And I'm like, well, yeah, man, like it's just the same thing over and over again. You got to do something to keep it from getting stagnant. <laughs> like, So I'm like, you, you, every turnaround, you give it a little bit of gas, you give it a little bit of gas. Stevie, I, I know I've mentioned it on the show before, but you know, when Stevie wonder played superstition on Sesame street, it's almost double the tempo at the end as it was at the beginning. Like every turnaround, just like, he's just, pouring fuel on the fire and it works. It's like for certain songs, it works not for every song. Like you, you gotta know when you're, when you're going to let that happen or cause that to happen. And when you're very much not going to let that happen, but, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, no, it tempo is, it's, it's a tool to use in the arsenal. Right. And uh, I love the way September starts. Where it's, you know, a little happy bouncy thing. Right. And then all of a sudden the horns come in and it's like, you know, and the tempo's just cooking all of a sudden. So why do you think that's a studio mistake? See, I, I think the intro, this is like, I, I'm totally pulling this out of thin air. Right. But, but it doesn't sound like this is how they wanted to craft the song. I think they they recorded it and then added the intro at a separate time. I think the two were merged together is hmm. is what it was. I don't know. But again, I like I haven't researched it. I haven't even Googled for it. So I have no idea if somebody knows feedback at giggabpodcast.com. I'd love to know wh why that is. But it is definitively five BPM faster once that the horns come in than it is prior to that. But I like it. It's like a, it is a cool little Pops. thing. What's that? It pops. And maybe that's, maybe it wasn't a studio mistake. Maybe it was intentional. Maybe it was to make it pop. And like the horns are adding energy. And also, by the way, here's five BPM on the house. You know, here you go. You can have that. <laughs> you have it. Take that's, that with you. That's free. You take that with you. That's right. That's, that's yours. You don't have to, that, that's yours to keep uh, whether you, whether you stay or not. So, yeah. You can't come back though. Once you go there, you got to stay there. You got, well, yeah, the, you know, we, it's funny because September with the, the wedding band with Uptown Celebration, we transition September into we are family and we slow it down. Uh, in that transition, we're playing the September outro, you know, body eyeing all, all night long. And then, uh, you know, we, we play a one measure kind of, it's not a fill, it's, but it is just, you know, the, it slows down into that, uh, and it's, it's easy to do because you know exactly where that song should sit and where September is, is too fast, but it's such a cool thing to watch the dance floor adapt to that and it works every time it like it's just this super comfortable thing and they know a change has happened they probably don't know why you know they're just moving and grooving and we just drag them down just a little bit and it's pretty much back to like what the intro tempo of september should be but we just play it straight through we don't speed it up uh when we start it but it's um but it you can slow it down and make it work but you have to be very careful choosing those moments i think you need a good drummer you do unfortunately they have to deal with me but uh <laughs> you know that's how that goes so <laughs> i you know what i teed that up for you man <laughs> thank you i appreciate that that's that's a that's a that's a kind thing to say but you need to like it is good to spend some time with a click and i find that if i if i go a period of time without playing to a click my time gets worse. My, my awareness of changes to time gets less. 
uh, which to me is worse. Like I, I want to know when that's happening so that it, it's, it, you know, it shouldn't happen without you as a musician knowing uh, is my feeling. So, uh, you know, I, and I, I, I'll catch that. And it's like, Oh yeah, that's right. I haven't, I've really been using the click as much in the woodshed. And so then I'll go to, you know, just playing. And all I do is play grooves with the click. I'll do, uh, a great exercise for drummers. In fact, I, I was talking when I was talking to your friend Mel uh, about just drums in general a couple of months ago, or maybe it was a year ago. I don't know. Time has changed, man. Uh, we uh, he was asking how to play fills in time, and one of my favorite exercises is to just start a click going and play four beats of simple groove. You know, kick, snare, mm-hmm. kick, snare, and it doesn't have to be simple groove. Like you can evolve this to be a very complex groove. And then fills, but it's, you know, it's sorry, four measures of simple groove and then four measures of fill. And the the great part about playing a fill for four measures is you learn how to count and even groove the fill as opposed to the fill being this suspension of the groove, which it, in my opinion, should not be like the groove continues, whether you're playing a fill or just time. And, uh, and so playing four measures of a fill and just going back and forth, four, of, four of straight groove, four of fill, four of time, four of fill, uh, really helps to, to a learn how to play fills in time because, you know, especially with the click going, you know, it's very, very quickly <laughs> you realize if you have a problem or not, but it, yeah. it, it also just teaches you to play fills that, that it communicate the groove. Like just cause you're not playing, you know, kick, snare, kick, snare doesn't mean you can you have to stop communicating groove. You can communicate groove. And I would say that this is absolutely true for other instruments as well. You know, I hear a guitar player solo and you can tell the players that are just like, okay, I'm going to play this trick out of my toolbox and that trick out of my toolbox and this trick out of my toolbox. Wait, where's the one? Okay. There's the one. Okay. Now this trick out of my toolbox. And some of those things are, are spectacular. It can be, you know, these great, huge fireworks of, of technique, but then you, hear guitar players who solo and are playing, you know, their licks, but in the context of the groove and communicating the groove and having a rhythm to it. And that's a a very important thing, I think. Uh, So, um, so there's an exercise for all of us to do, you know, play, yeah, play rhythm for four, four measures, solo for four measures, rhythm for four measures, solo for four measures. It's, you look, I learn a lot doing that. Like even like, I mean, I, I did it last week. I was like, oh, I haven't done this in a while. So yeah, I think it's important. I, I tell you something about time. Like I, I have perceived myself to have good time. I think most musicians think they have good time. <laughs> so I have a, I have been fooling around with a looper for a long time. Yeah. And you know, this thing where you, where you lay down some kind of percussive thing, you tap on your guitar and stuff like that. I am stunned by how bad my time is, right? Like yeah. I can follow time, but can I create and sustain time on my own was a different thing. Right. Yes. And it, you know, it, it probably isn't as bad as I'm making it out, but it really sticks out to me. You know, like, you know, when, when one of my accents is, is a little late, it feels like it's a month late. You know, yeah. it's just, yeah. and you, you, it, and having talked to other people who do looping, they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. you kind of are stunned when you first are hit in the face with it about, about what you think your perception of your own time is. But it's one of those things that, you know, just, you just practice it and listen to it and be aware of it and focus on it, play along with, you know, beats and that type of thing. And, but, you know, always striving for perfect time, I think is a great essential skill. Yeah. Good time awareness. It's important. I, I'll never forget the, the audition that I went to for the, uh, the blues band that I played in the blues trio that I played in in Texas with Murray Woods. And there was one tune that he started on the guitar. Uh, I think it was this uh, black cat bone, which is an Albert Collins tune. And he just started, he's like, I'll I'll set the tempo. And he, you know, he laid down this groove and it was like, oh, wow. Like this guy understands how to communicate time on the guitar. It was just like this eye opening thing. Like, holy crap. I have a ton to learn from this guy, (laughs) you know? And, but he also had the ability to completely melt your face with his solos. Like, like even after playing with him for a, a few years, there would be, you know, moments in the, in a show where the bass player and I would look at each other, like, I, I don't know, man, like, I don't, like, how does he do this? Yeah, he was, but he really was a, you know, a, a student and, and, you know, approaching the level of master, if you will, 
of, of just being able to communicate time with the guitar. And I was like, yeah, okay. Ah, I see. There's more to grasshopper learn, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was like, and I was, I was very, very uh, fortunate that they, they chose me to play in that band. Uh, I think they'd been through 15 drummers and I was the 15th and they're like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 I, there was one moment we were playing a cover of, uh, cause we played some of their originals in, in the, in the audition too. But I think we were playing Lenny, which is this uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan instrumental. And uh, just in the middle of it, like it was just everything just locked in. It was like butter. And it was a song I'd never played before. It was pretty straight ahead, you know, tune. And, and we all just looked at each other like, okay, yeah, we can make this work. Here yeah. we are. Yeah. Here we are. Yeah, here we are. Right. Like I can envision this working on stage. We've got other things that we need to, you know, hammer out because it's the first time we've met, but you know, like, yeah, this is, this is doable. So, yeah. Cool. Well, uh, I want to tell I you about, about, uh, some lessons from the gig that I had last Saturday, but I, why don't you talk about our sponsor for a few minutes? I would love to. Yeah. Ultimate ears at, uh, ultimate ears pro is our sponsor for this week, as I mentioned, and they are crushing it right now. I mean, it, you know, we've, we've been getting back to live music, Paul and I, on stage, Ultimate Ears is the, uh, we use, I use the UE 11 pros with the ambient, Paul, I think you use the UE sevens. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and they just know how to cater to musicians. They really get it. They are focused on it because they are musicians that use this stuff. We had Brian Geller on the show. He's in charge of marketing over there. He's also David Lee Roth in the Atomic Punks. And he's using this stuff all the time, as are many, many people there. And they've been doing this since 1995. They've got a deal going on right now through December 5th. They have their holiday promo and it is their best deal of the year. They've been sponsors for most of the year. So I can tell you that is true because we've seen their deals. We look at it, you know, several times a month when we're pulling together these spots 360 bucks off the UE 11 Pro, 450 bucks off the UE 18 Plus Pro, $660 off the UE Live Pro. Uh, you can visit our special link at custom.ultimateears.com slash giggab, or you can just go to giggabpodcast.com and click it in the show notes. It's the same link. You can get there either way. Uh, our code giggab20 will still get you 20% off of most things, uh, at, at, at most of the custom all ears at the store, but this code through 12, five, it'll say it at the top of the site. It's U E V I P that saves you even more. So go check it out. You can get to experience what Paul and I get to use at the gigs that we play custom.ultimateears.com slash gig gab. And our thanks to ultimate ears for sponsoring this episode and for doing what they do. Yep. Great, great Good product. Stuff. I agree. I would, I guess I would add to that. Their service has been unbelievable. When I've had to send mine in, they turn them around quickly. It's, you know, they, they, yeah. the, the total customer experience is really extraordinary. You're so, right. I wind up sending, company. I wind up sending mine in about once a year and I have the same experience. It's just like, they, they know what, they know that you need it and they know what yeah. to do. They know how to look at it and just fix it and send it back or not fix it. If there's a problem, they'll fix it, but they'll also just service them and clean them and all that good stuff. Yeah. It's, it's great. Yeah. Good You're right. Stuff. Customer focused. Cool. Yeah. So I had a gig uh, on Saturday. It was a, uh, I wouldn't say, I guess it's kind of a corporate gig. It was a private gig sure. for a big a big high school that was doing uh -huh. a thank you to their donor parents. And there were a couple of things that happened. First of all, the first lesson was our sound crew had plenty of time to come in, set up, and do their thing, which meant we walked into an absolutely beautiful, ready-to-go stage, rung out sound system, and everybody got to pretty much just load in, set up a couple demo songs, but the, you know, everything was tweaked so well, you know, again, our mixer, our Midas board keeps our, our settings. So, you know, we, we have a, we're in the ballpark as soon as we go. And just the reflection of the lack of stress when time, time is your friend or your enemy, right? The ability to actually have enough time for everybody to do what they need to do without, without bouncing into each other. And I think often as musicians, you know, we are so valuable of our time that we want to compress our time, show up as close to downbeat as possible, you know, and then something happens and then there's stress and stress bleeds into performance mm. and it just makes for a difficult day. But this was, this was absolute nirvana, you know, beautiful. And so then the next thing about this gig was 
because of the nature of the things, there were about 400 people there. Um, I didn't realize we were the center of everything. So literally, you know, it was a dance show and I didn't, you know, that wasn't communicated to me that we were everything. I thought we were one of many things that were going to be going on. Um, but like many of these types of things, uh, it starts off slower than many of our public gigs, right? right? People are talking, people are sitting, people are eating, you know, whatever it may be. And so, you know, it, it takes, and it was a, it was a 90 minute gig. We ended up playing about two hours. Um, you know, the first half hour where we usually have quite a bit of our high energy stuff and I should know, you know, ease into stuff. Um, uh, you know, dance floor, quarter fill, half fill, quarter fill, you know, you know, not quite there. And then about halfway through the gig, it kicks in and, you know, everybody had a really good time and it was a really good thing. But um, I, I wanted to share that it's been a couple weeks since we played. Um, we're about to head into a period where it's going to be six weeks until the band plays again. And there were little things that we missed that we hadn't missed in a long, long time. Mm. Little, you know, you know, one guy's intro wasn't quite there. Absolutely. One guy wasn't, right? And so in my mind, I'm, I'm taking a note and I'm trying to say, should I send a note to the guys afterwards? Like, hey guys, it was a little looser than we have been. Just want to make sure everybody stay focused. You know, we're going about to have a lull, stay focused. I decided to kind of leave it alone and, you know, assume that everybody in my band cares enough that they know, right? Sure. But it brought on into my mind that, you know, we're about to have a six-week lull. Now, when we went through the whole lockdown thing and the band didn't even see each other for a year, we were surprisingly together the first time we did play together. Muscle memory, whatever it may be. Um, focus, attention, I think, is part of that. The excitement to be back together to play. It all kind of clicked in and away we went. But lulls happen, and they happen for a few reasons. They happen, you know, whether... They happen what based on the vibe of the gig. They have based on the vibe of the song. You know the vibe. The you know what the audience is giving back to you, and uh, dealing with lulls is an interesting thing. Like I said, we're about to go six weeks. We're not going to play again until New Year's Eve, and uh, you know I I think I will kind of wait a week or two and just say, hey guys, last gig was a little looser than we'd been in quite a while. You mm -hmm. know, just everybody keep your eye on the ball. You know, you know. D d d Personal responsibility, you know, you, you do you, but, you know, let's go. And uh, I don't know, do you, do you experience that with bands that you're in, even bands that play together often? Sometimes you have a night where like, oh, here we go. It's going to be one of those nights. Yeah, it's just a yeah. loose night. Yeah, it happens. And it could be a function of the, you know, the sound on stage or something about the setup, like a, a an in-the-moment distraction, right, that, that, that causes – people to be not quite as focused on just playing as, you know, as things go. And that's, you know, that's par for the course. There's going to be some level of that and you just got to learn to deal with it, but, but it does happen. And then it can be, you know, things like you said, where, well, it's been six weeks or it's been a few weeks uh, that, you know, people, I, I think the difference between the, you know, the, the not playing during lockdown and then not playing for a few weeks now that we've, begun to resume things is very different. I, I think we all knew coming out of lockdown that it was like, Oh, it's been a while. Like we've got to all pay attention and, and, you know, get the rust off and figure that out. I think at some level that was a given, right? Whereas after two or three weeks, especially if it's been, you know, you're playing for, you know, eight weeks straight or something. And then you have a few weeks off. You're like, Oh, we got this in the bag. Like we've been, we've been doing this. This has been fine. It's nice to have a week off, right? <laughs> like, you know, the last thing you're going to do is think about, all right, now I got to polish things up for this gig that's coming up. And so I think that makes a lot of sense to me that you would have some, some sort of errors of, of oversight at a gig like that, I, you know, it's, it's what I, what I often refer to as the sophomore slump, right? You know, you have a great first gig and it's like, Oh, we're confident we're coming in. And it's like, yeah, but that confidence isn't really earned. Uh, you know, the second gig is going to suffer because of that. You're not coming in with that same attentive mindset. And sure. so I think that makes sense as far as what to do about it in your specific situation. I think 
I would take all those notes, right, that you came up with, especially as many specifics as you can remember from the gig, like, oh, there was this, there was that. And not necessarily calling people out, but, you know, if if one person screwed up the beginning of September, let's say, just because, you know, whatever, uh, instead of saying, hey, you know, Timmy, you need to be better on the beginning of September, just we need to be better on the beginning. Take yeah, a look at it. We. It's all we. Right, exactly. Because it really is we, right? Like, if, it doesn't matter if, if everybody screws up or one person screws up, it, it's the band, right? And I would, I would put those in a note and set a note on my calendar for about, well, you know, New Year's, a week before New Year's is Christmas Day. So... You know, I don't know what the right time would be, but I would wait to send it out until we as the band are at a point where we might be thinking about the gig. And so for a New Year's gig, I might send it on December 27th. Right. You know, like people get through Christmas. OK, great. Now, hey, guys, you know, here's the thing. Here's the the details for load in or timing or, you know, whatever you need to send out. And then also remember that last gig we played. We'd had a couple of weeks off and things were a little rusty. Here's what I remember from the gig. Please uh. chime in with whatever you remember from the gig so that we can all sort of polish as we head into, you know, whatever New Year's our New Year's gig. Right. That so this is really interesting to me because the lens I'm hearing what you're sharing and what I what I'm thinking about, like Yes, it is we because you're not, you know, there's not a lot to, you know, unless something really egregious happens, sure. there's not a lot to be gained by calling someone out in front no. of the band, right? No. However, it dawns on me that um, it is a useful thing in a leader led band to let the band know the leader is listening and paying attention. Yeah. And, you know, wants to continue to um, prompt. The qualitative part, you know, the, you know, the, the focus that everybody has. I, oh, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that's unique to leader led bands. I mean, that's mm -hmm. any band, right. Is like if anybody on stage is hearing things I, and, and I think there's, there's often it, it, when we, when you and I have these discussions, I think there's this, the, and I know you don't, I know you don't think this way, but, but it, it sometimes comes across that there's, it's a very binary distinction between there's a leader led band and then there's just it is a ca chaos. It's a fault of mine. Absolutely. It is a deep, <laughs> I, I know I, and I'll admit that. And I think sure. about it all the time. Like, yeah. like how much of my worldview am I, am I bought into my own hubris here? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but I know like you and I have been in bands where there's multiple people like our, you know, the Macworld band. Yes, there was a a de facto a decided leader, an explicit leader for each gig, and that person was in charge of the set list. But that didn't mean everybody else was just you know there with their mouths shut. If somebody noticed something, if something, you remember me, if you remember me, I was one or the other. I know I was either, that's true. I was either a band guy or a leader guy. Well, it was my year to lead. I would you know do that thing. But other than that. And, and again, that's my own personal feeling that I don't yeah. live in between those two places very well. I'm like, so me, Chuck, and, the leader, me, Chuck and Chris lived in between all the time. Right. Even yeah. if, if, if one of us was wearing the leader hat, it was like, okay, well, I'm the one that gets stuck building the stupid set list, but really we're all in this together, it, you know, and it, and that's, you know, so there it's a division of labor is how I see the leader role in, in bands more so than just, you, you know, I'm just here to serve like, you know, a, a, a military style sort of, you know, soldiering on sort of thing. It's like, yeah, there, there needs to be a leader, even in a band that doesn't have an explicit leader, at least from the outside. There's always going to be a leader for any given scenario. You know, you're getting ready to go into the studio. Somebody's got to organize that. Somebody's got to, yeah. here's the songs we're going to, even if it's a band discussion, someone's got to collect the information and, and like coalesce it. And, and the same is true for set lists at a gig. And the same is true for pulling together the logistics of a gig, right? Like there's definitely a leader. And on stage, somebody needs to be leading things all the way through it, it, the, the democracies. I, I've never experienced a successful on stage democracy. Somebody needs so the to sense say, that I always Here's feel is, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the sense that I always feel is, um, musicians. Well, no, my horn, pl horn players come from a big band vibe and big bands have leaders. Otherwise it's total chaos. Right. Yes. And so my horn section it, it is second nature to them. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to put, put, put something in front of me and I'll play it. But of the, you know, X amount of rhythm players I've had come through, 
they all have different perspectives as to what they're comfortable with with regards to having a leader. Mm-hmm. It, you know, and and the vibe that I've gotten that I've always I've always wrestled with is. I want a leader up to a point or I want a leader to do the stuff I don't want to do. Yeah. But when it's the stuff I do want to do it, then don't be my leader. Stay Let out of my way. Do. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> which, which again, for a guy who lives in oddly black and white places, I, I definitely struggle with, with yeah. addressing those types of things. And it has been a skill to find a, figure out how to co op those types of things. So again, I think for the overall 10 piece band, there are my concepts of leadership. You know that I that I try to do to keep us a cohesive unit. Sometimes some guys will roll their eyes that they don't think that it's you know that that's really useful. Other of course, guys, yeah. on the very same item, will will be like you know that was really cool. And so you know, in any band, I guess you're kind of feeling your way. And yeah, I I would say that if it was a pure democracy, but the the democracy demurred to one guy to kind of take on this one leadership role. What a what a thankless role that is if if it's not by consensus though. So uh-huh. again, just just for me, it just it, it, this is why I live in this odd black and white thing. And the thing is, I'm very happy when I'm not the leader. Tell me, and you know, and the few times I've had it, it is actually really easy. I mean, it's really fun for me to only have to be responsible for my part of the music and you know and walk in and do that type of stuff. Yeah. If someone asks me for my opinion, I'll offer it. I'm not being passive aggressive about the whole thing. But <laughs> wait, wait, that's that's the best part though, is being a you know in a leader led yes, band. You, you get crazy to, people, that's the best part. Yeah, you get Us to be passive aggressive. <laughs> You know, are you, really? Are you sure that's the next song you want to play? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Yep. Whatever. Not, not my first choice, but. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you have fun with that. Yeah, I, I guess. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> if that's what you think. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's the best part of it. No, it, like, I, I was joking with the, when we were talking about the, uh, you know, I had the fling guys, a couple of them over and we were talking and I, I don't know why it came up, but it was like somebody was divulging some skill they had. And I'm like, yeah, it's like me. Anytime I join a band, I tell myself, I'm not going to let them know that I know anything about sound, right? Like that Dave bang drum. That's it. I don't want to be stuck bringing the PA and have to control it and all of that stuff at the gigs. Right. Cause it's a lot extra to do. I set up an entire drum set, control the PA, you know, like it's, it's more, uh, however, I, you know, the reality is it usually makes it that, that if I'm able to conceal that knowledge from people, of course, doing a podcast like this doesn't really help me in my cause here, but, uh, if I'm able to conceal that knowledge, we'll get to, you know, sound check of the first gig. And unless they've got somebody that really does know what they're doing, I, that's the moment where I step in. And I'm like, hey, let me help out. Like, you know, and then, of course, it's like it's over. You know, once Pandora's box is open, that's the end of that. But it's because, I, you know, I want the band to sound good. I want it, you know, I want to put on a good product and and whatever I can do, whatever skills I might have, uh, I, I'm happy to share. And whatever faults I might have, hopefully somebody else can overcome them and, you know, step into those those spots. But it's, you know, it's that kind of thing where it's like, oh, we all have to do the things. It's It's the sum of the parts. Right. And so. I don't know. I, yeah, that actually would be a democracy that I, I would be very excited about is literally if everybody was like, hey, we're all in. Let's divide up the work. Let's yeah. all, you know, and um, that's fling look. for sure is is that like we we made X. We had explicit conversations about that. Once we started gigging, we had one gig. I, I had totally forgotten about this. We're one of our people. I'm not going to call this person out because it 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 was a fixed problem immediately. But we got to the end of the gig and they packed up their stuff and we're like, all right, I, my stuff's in my car. See you later. And we all kind of looked at each other like, oh, gosh, like that's the cardinal sin. You don't do that. You, you know, and mm-hmm. and and it, it was not Russ who who did this. And I, I said something to Russ and he's like, you know, I, I don't think he knows. And so it was like, oh, oh, OK. You know, and so we just had the conversation like, hey. And as soon as we did, he's like. Oh my gosh, of course. Like I can't, we can't leave each other hanging. Like we're all in this together. It's like, right. He's like, never thought about it before. Completely clueless. I'm super sorry. And it was like, yeah, no problem. Like, and and then, but that was great because it opened the door to this evolving conversation that really has not ever ended about how to make 
like our load in it gigs the most efficient that it can be. But the nice part about that is it's like if somebody's standing around and we have these moments where it's like you you realize things have evolved, you know, sort of implicitly tacitly to where, you know, somebody's shouldering more of the load than, than somebody else. And there's literally a moment where there's, you know, one or two guys standing there doing nothing. And then, you know, the other three guys are, you know, running around like crazy people trying to get it all done. And it's like, if we notice that now we know maybe we can stop in the moment and, and delegate, but certainly after the fact, you know, we'll, we'll sort of, you know, debrief it and, and say, as we do sort of the postmortem on the gig, we'll be like, all right, hey, we noticed this. This has happened twice now. So, okay, this particular job gets shifted to that guy. And, and th like, it, it makes it great. Not only does it make it efficient, but it, like, like you said, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of because we, you know, everybody is in it together. It's not just lip service. It's, no, we're all yeah. just doing the work and then we're done. And it's great, it, you know. And what, so, what, let, let's just read. Break yeah. this down a little bit. To me, where that gets even stronger, of course, I could see it in an environment where everybody volunteers to take their part of the work. Mm -hmm. The issue is, if someone's fallen down or not doing their dig gig, what is the group response to pull someone into better behavior? We've, we've, like I said, with Fling, we've experienced that, and it's, it's never been about someone actively wanting to shirk their responsibility. It's more, I don't know what to do next. And, and so knowing that that's the, the vibe, if somebody is standing around, like I said, oftentimes in the moment, it can be, Hey, can you go, you know, run all the cables for the mics or can you go d do this? And they usually, you know, we all sort of have an awareness of all the things that need to happen. And it might just be, hey, can you take my drum cases and and collapse them together and go, you know, stash them in the green room or, you know, whatever. Like, they, they, like everybody knows what has to happen. They just might not be as aware of what is left to, to do or what is next to do. And so it, it, in fling, it's a very much a vibe of, we can all just tell each other what needs to be done next and nobody takes offense at it. It, it just, yeah. nobody, nobody, it's never delivered nor. It's a working democracy. It's a working democracy. It's never delivered nor received as we assume because you weren't doing something that you were, you know, trying to be lazy and make us all do the work. It just, it happened that way. And so we can fix it in the moment and we do. It's great. Yeah, we're a relatively psychologically healthy band. It doesn't it doesn't hurt that one of the guys in the band is is actually a a, a <laughs> professor of psychology. So, you know, we like we get deep into these kinds of conversations. But it's super helpful to just be able to have it out in the open like, "Oh, that's interesting." Like, you know, I can see why you might think I was being, you know, irresponsible in that moment. That makes sense. And like here's mm -hmm. and you know, Michael often come up Mike is our our doctor in the band, uh, PhD. And he, uh, he's not good with like injuries or anything, or at least we haven't tested that part of his, his, I don't think he has any medical training in that regard. Uh, but you know, he'll, he'll come up with the, you know, the name of the, the, the phenomenon or whatever that causes these things to happen. He'll be like, Oh yeah, yeah, this is cause he's a teacher. He's like, he teaches psychology. So he knows all of this stuff and he'll be, it's fascinating to learn all these things, but it does keep that air of, of, of progress happening as opposed to mm -hmm. resentment, uh, which is very, a very easy thing to, to kind of fall into for sure. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. I don't know. It's just stuff to do. Hey, I got one more thing I want to share for today. Yeah, man. I saw, uh, YouTube bought the rights to it and YouTube is streaming it for free. So everybody not, you don't have to have YouTube TV or anything, Okay, but this Tom, this Tom Petty documentary, um, somewhere you feel free. Awesome. Just, awesome the video that they have that they recovered from their vaults because they were actually making a documentary right they were actually filming you know during the process of him making that album but this is the one i saw only... at, at south by right yes yeah oh it's fantastic highly recommended yep. yes oh yeah and yeah, the yeah. insights from the band you know posthumously about tom are just remarkable the video of them you know in their clubhouse you know they had a warehouse somewhere where they would hang out play, rehearse, record, um, was, was pretty cool. And, uh, just the stories about their creative process and, you know, what making this album meant to them, what, 
with Tom, you know, it, it, Wildflowers is a Tom Petty solo album, even though. Even though it's I not, can't. right? Like when, I remember when we had this, it was Gig Gab 298, by the way, folks, I'll put a link in the show notes. But when we had this conversation, I, I said, I remember saying to you that, you know, it, as much as it, as, as much as it was officially a Tom Petty solo record, it really did become Tom Petty with, you know, the Heartbreakers as his band effectively. Right. And, uh. And I remember having that conversation. You're like, oh, I never, never really thought about it that way. And but the, the documentary definitely communicates that. Yeah. Well, you know, he was using Campbell on guitar and, and Tench on keyboards quite a bit. You know, he had a rub with his drummer, Stan Lynch at the time, who right. I think is an, an awesome drummer. I, I don't know what you think about him, but, you know, Breakdown and American Girl are iconic rock and roll grooves, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so I just I just think Stan Lynch is is awesome, but Ferroni is freaking fantastically awesome, right? And, yeah. and it, it was took him to a new place, you know, that it, different types of sounds. Yeah. Anyway, but and then brought in Ferroni for the sessions, and Ferroni ends up being a band and, member, and he so. became a wildflower, or he be, sorry, he became a, a, a <laughs> member of the. He was a wildflower. He became a member of the Heartbreakers as a byproduct yeah. of that record. That's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, but uh, anyway, the the documentary is just wonderful the video the music is what wonderful some of the outtakes they share i mean it's it's a great great use of your time like i said it's on youtube for anybody to stream anytime that's amazing i didn't realize youtube picked it up i'm always so happy when i find the, you know i get to see these movies for south by southwest and I, I come here and i tell you folks about them and then it's like i'm really sorry you can't see it like there's no way even if you want to be a criminal you can't go steal it from somewhere like there's just nothing <laughs> i'm yeah. sorry and well, so it's like the, the Beatles get back thing is going to be on Disney, which I can't imagine has the reach and subscribers to that audience. I mean, maybe they all have kids and so they all buy the Disney channel, right? Yeah. But yeah. you know, you, you would think it would have landed on Netflix or, you know, something Amazon mm -hmm. something with wider distribution. But did you, by the way, did you see the uh, Beatles thing on 60 minutes on Sunday night? No, I didn't. I, I need to go back and hunt that me down. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Me yeah, too. yeah. 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 That's yeah. Yeah. The making a let it be. Right. 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 Yeah. No, I want to go see that or I want to, I want to go find that. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I, I don't know that that under the volcano movie has gotten distribution. Cause that was the other one. What's that? I've not seen that one. Yeah. I don't, I'm looking at the at rush film site because that's where it was. They say coming soon. The trailer. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that that's gotten distribution and that was a great one. That's the one about, uh, air studios, Montserrat, George Martin's, uh, studio down there, but just so well done. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I don't know that it's, I, I, I'm looking to see if it made it out anywhere, but I don't think it's gotten distribution yet. So let's hope somebody picks it up. They, they, uh, official release. Wait, wait, wait. It says July 26th out on digital. Oh, it is. Okay. It is. It's available. Oh yeah. You can get it on all the things. All right. Maybe we talked about that. But I will put yep. that in the thing. All right, great. Oh, and one more is um, this week, Thursday, if you uh, do it through iTunes, and I think Friday through other streaming channels, is the release of, as we spoke about, the great Bruce Springsteen's No Nukes show from 1978. Oh, wow. Holy crap. I mean, it, I think it's about 12, it's not terribly long. It's about 12 or 14 songs. The sound is remastered fantastically and whatever they did to you know breathe life into the video that they took the little bits that they've kind of teased out you you really get an essence of what the energy was like when he was 30 years old i mean 72 now 71, yeah yeah right? 72 but um oh, i'll have to i'll have to watch you've seen this already yeah. well they've released three songs ah okay you know to kind of tease you and you yeah. can see those yeah. literally the vibrancy coming off the stage. And remember that was a gig where, you know, James Taylor played Jackson Brown, Tom Petty, and the heartbreakers played at this no new right. show. Right. I mean, it was, there were some heavy hitters and, and, you know, Springsteen was 30 at the time, 29 or 30 at the time. Wow. So, you know, he'd, he'd been on the big stage for about six years after being, you know, largely a, a club musician. Right. right. Holy, holy crap. I mean, the degree to which he he takes live rock performing to another place to me is just it's thrilling. It's great to go back and look, and it's beautiful and it sounds beautiful. The the, the video awesome. is gorgeous and it sounds gorgeous. Oh, I'll have to check this out because that's that's the part of Springsteen that I never got to see. 
right? Was like the, the, was the, the early energetic, the hungry part, if you will. Yeah. Not that he's not still hungry, but it's a different kind of hunger when oh, he was starving back then. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, right. yes. fi- fighting for his creative life, you know, he'd been, he'd been right. largely shut out of stuff for a long time because that long lawsuit that he had over, over his rights. Right. So yeah. Right. Anyway, right. I, I, check it out. It, it, you know, it will give you a charge to want to pick up and go out and play something. Cool. Awesome. I will, I will watch that. That's great. Folks. I, we, next week is Thanksgiving week. And so we are, we are off for uh, a week. Uh, there are other videos to watch. If you go check out flings, Facebook page, we have been, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes, but we've been slowly mixing and mastering a bunch of the songs that will be on our next EP here and as we finish each one russ has been taking the audio and matching it up to some kind of crazy video that really thus far he's made them like it it seems like these are videos that have been made for the songs but i can tell you they have not but russ finds the right ones and matches them all up and so there's uh i think three videos out there's a there's a fourth one that will be released in the next week or two uh just to kind of you know dole them out but it's been an interesting thing it's a it's a way to get attention for the songs. And I think it's working really well um, and it's fun. So I will, I'll put a link to that so you can go watch some awesome. of those too. Yeah. You got anything else, my friend? That's my, that's my bag today, man. Same. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out with us. Make sure to go check out uh, our, uh, our sponsor here at custom.ultimateears.com slash gig gab. I like that they built us a URL. Makes me feel special. Happy Thanksgiving to all our listeners in the U.S. And hey, everybody, always be performing. Good advice. Happy Thanksgiving.